Καλημέρα, καλημέρα, καλημέρα σε όλου από το bisman.gr και το Γιάννη Μιλιάτση. Another English webinar interview with Anthony Kunduris. Hello, Anthony, how are you? Καλά, καλά. Uh, Anthony uh, Anthony's, uh, doesn't speak uh, that much Greek. He only knows how to say καλά and taxi and some words a little bit Greek, yeah? <laughs> so we're going to conduct this interview uh, in English. Now, Anthony, uh, let me say some things about you and your book. Anthony is the writer of uh, Run Frictionless, the book which I will post a link down below for you to find. And um, he has a decade of experience, in, of experience consulting to technology and software as a service startups. Brands include Salesforce, Google, SAP and IBM. He specializes in designing automated sales and marketing systems. He has consulting to SaaS vendors in the United Kingdom, Korea, Singapore, the Philippines and Australia. Anthony has been a founder of two startups. His first business, Firestarter, consulted on Facebook and iPad app development in Southeast Asia. The firm was acquired by Novus Media in 2010. He co-founded Future Books, an accounting firm servicing over 500 startups and ranked at zero's uh, number one reseller in Asia. When he's not working, Anton enjoys racing bikes and sailing boats. And you can find him on runfrictionless.com. Uh, Hello, Anthony. Welcome back. Thank you. Good morning, Yanis. Good morning, good morning. I don't know, is it morning there too? I can hear the birds outside. It's the afternoon. It's the afternoon. <laughs> so it must be. <laughs> all right, all right. Uh, in the previous conversation we had, we talked about uh, your book, your new book, Run Frictionless. Let me put it up here just for a moment so people can see what we are talking about. Uh, your book, Run Frictionless, which I read and I was excited to uh, read and uh, I really liked the book. So, uh, we talked about what friction is and uh, a lot of more things. In this book, you promised, in this uh, interview, you promised us that we're going to talk a little bit more about the four Q's. Right, right. The framework well, that you uh, explain in your book. What are the four Q's? Yeah, okay, Yanni. So, let me give you guys uh, like a 10 15 minute compressed simplified version right of the four Q's decision making framework um, so let's start with uh, in this demonstration I'm going to begin in quadrant one but uh, you don't have to start your journey of applying the four Q's in quadrant one you could begin in quadrant two or three or four uh, but today Yanis I'm just going to start in quadrant one with the most difficult question uh, in quadrant one that many organizations from small or large must ask themselves and that is who do we serve and I think you is this question we have to answer it on two levels who we serve first of all we have to be clear about who we serve today who we serve tomorrow and in defining who we serve today and who we deserve who we serve tomorrow uh, we define who we never serve that is those customers who are in fact a liability to the organization. So quadrant one is really important because when you're trying to scale up as a startup and you want to pay sales commissions to salespeople, you don't want them to bring you anybody, right? Like on, the, on our last session we talked about this, this person um, and we both agreed that there's nobody called anybody. Uh, you know, there's Sally, there's Tom and there's Harry. Um, and so we need to speak directly to these people, right? Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, I gotta tell so you, it, it, it helped me a lot uh, clarifying uh, who to speak to, uh, but we're gonna talk about this later. Right. Well, if you'd like to, we could just talk now, uh, perhaps, about your experience in Quadrant One and what what did you, you learn uh, after reading the book and how how have you applied it? Well, the first thing I realized was that I didn't have a clear image of the people I was selling to and I needed to clarify my image more and the people I didn't want to sell to and that was the hard part for me to clarify the people I didn't want to sell to. So it why, helped me why very is much. That important? 
because uh, I felt that I was, um, you know, spending energy and uh, resources on uh, leads and people that I, I shouldn't have done that. Mm. Yeah, I've seen situations where we have like opportunity costs where the time that we should have spent on customers who really need us right now, we spent that time on customers who actually really don't need us. Um, and the, I think one of the questions that we can ask ourselves when we're trying to work out who we serve is just ask yourself this question, the customer that I'm serving right now, are they likely to leave me a review? Are they likely to say something positive about my organization? And if you think that they're not likely to ever say anything positive, or if you think that they're not likely to even be bothered to leave a review about your product or services, perhaps you shouldn't be serving them because perhaps what you're doing is not very valuable to them. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I always thought about uh, serving people in terms of financial uh, you know, gains, but when you talk in the book about leaving a good review about you, it really clicked on me because that's the way to scale your business easier. Absolutely. Um, and what's interesting about this idea of who you serve today and who you serve tomorrow is all organizations can create themselves two sales funnels. One is the sales pipeline of the customers they serve today based on the profiles they know they can serve. But then they've also got profiles that they're getting ready to serve, right? They know that in maybe in six months or one year they can serve another profile. So they should start thinking about those customers, who they might be, and begin thinking about approaching them and creating a second pipeline. Exactly, and that was the, one of the things that I did. I realized that I was trying to prepare the company to serve clients that I can't serve, the, uh, serve them right now, but I will serve them in a year from now. So that gave me the freedom to really focus on the customers I can serve right now and slowly prepare for those customers to serve later. Yeah, and there's a sense of honesty in this, Yanis. Like, you, imagine you say to a customer, a prospect that calls you, you say, look, I can't serve you today, but in six months or a year, I will be in the right position to help you. I mean, how honest and trustworthy do you appear? Because most people are so used to being sold to and told a false story that when they hear this from you, it, it is refreshing. Exactly, exactly. And... Uh... I write this in my, in my book, lose a sale, win a person. Because if you lose that yeah. sale at that moment, that door will always be open for you. Yeah. So let, let's move on to quadrant two then. We've covered quadrant one. Quadrant two is uh, what we serve. So this is the products or the services, if you like, that we sell or serve to quadrant one. So we identify who we, who we serve in quadrant one and they effectively buy from Quadrant 2. Now in Quadrant 2, I can think of some things that are really important. Um, you'd be surprised, you know, the number of organizations that I talk to that do not have a clear understanding of what they sell. Like, I'll talk to different people in the business and I get different specifications, different prices, different options and um, we found uh, just by doing market research where we will um, interrogate a customer's, uh, uh, interrogate an organization say on email, then telephony, then online chat and these different organizations within the company have different points of view about what they're selling and they're all different. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, maybe also in the same organization, uh, the founder has a different uh, view of what he sells than the sellers, than the salespeople. Yeah, I was working in a company once upon a time where the founder was mixing visionary messages with sales messages, right? Visionary being where we want to be in, say, 12 months, right? Mm -hmm. And sales messages being like what we have right now in the warehouse to sell the customer. Mixing the two of them together and confusing the organization about what do we actually sell? Because when you sell software or human services, 
which are not tangible and you cannot physically pick them up, it's very difficult to go into the warehouse and find them, right? They're digital. Exactly, 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 exactly. It's so really what we yeah. found was, Jan, is that you, you, organizations add friction to the sales process by presenting different versions of the product to customers. When customers come to them and talk to them, they get different answers. So if they get different answers, they well, imagine if the company is this disorganized about understanding their own product, imagine how bad the product is. <laughs> yeah. The... It, it it goes the you know uh, the the salesperson loses his credibility it plummets if you do that because uh, yeah uh, the the buyer listens to the salesperson uh, listens to the founder he get, gets all these mixed messages and you know he can trust trust plummets yeah so what we try to do is, is we try to get the product the product manager to write internal fact sheets which document the features, the limitations of the products and the workarounds, mapping those limitations back to Quadrant 1 to get a Quadrant 1, Quadrant 2 fit. How, how did you find Quadrant 2 working with that in your business? What did you change and learn? Uh, that was the point that I didn't have to change a lot in my business because I, I, I created my products. So it was easy for me to have a clear image of what do I sell and uh, what, do, what does the product really do, what's the value of the product. So uh, that was the quadrant I didn't spend so much time uh, on to. I really uh, clarified some uh, portions of my products and uh, had them on paper right back there as you see. <laughs> and hide them on my, on my board and uh, you know uh, had them more organized for me to, to, to watch. Right, okay. So let's get on to Quadrant 3 then, shall we? Yeah, just a moment to put it up there. So Quadrant 3 is uh, who we are. There we go. Quadrant 3 down the bottom there, who we are. And uh, what's very interesting about Quadrant 3 is we've found in certain buying decisions, customers make 70% of their buying decision in Quadrant 3, not in Quadrant 2. So mm -hmm. it is true that uh, customers make rational buying decisions between Quadrant 1 and Quadrant 2, right? I, I compare the features, I look at the limits, I, I think about the workarounds and then I make a buying decision once I've considered the various products that are available. But, um, you know, if you think about recently, uh, the launch of the Tesla truck, right? Yeah. And I don't know if you got to see the product launch, but it didn't go quite according to plan. Exactly. You're referring to the infamous broken window. <laughs> right, yeah. It's, so Elon breaks the window, right? And yeah. uh, what, the, what the automotive journalists said was very interesting. They said, well, the next day they reported that the, the car is a flop the truck will not work and nobody wants it. And interestingly, uh, by the end of business that day, uh, Tesla posted a press release saying they, they had taken over 100,000 orders of the Tesla truck. And what that said to me is, is that customers, their customers are not buying at a Quadrant 2, they're buying at a Quadrant 3. They believe in the direction that the company is going, and more importantly, they think the company understands them. Mm -hmm. uh, how hard is it for a company to uh, get the message out there of who they are and uh, have people uh, believe in them, in their message, and follow them by who they are and not just by their products? Yeah, so the danger is if you don't work Quadrant 3, if you don't have a Quadrant 3 in your business and you're relying on a Quadrant 2 only, um, the, the, the problem you will encounter, like all businesses, is you'll have a bad product day, right? Elon had a bad product day. The wind, the glass broke. And when customers buy at a Quadrant 3 and not just from Quadrant 2, you have a lot more loyalty, but more importantly, they will forgive you for when you have bad product days. But if they have no shared belief with your organization, if they do not share, um, if they don't have this sort of moment where they say, oh my goodness, 
I've been telling people this for years. Finally, somebody listened to me and built the product that I've been telling people. Okay, if they're not hearing this from their customer, they're not really sharing a belief with them, and they will always buy rationally and only from Quadrant Two. Yeah. Now, your question was interesting. You know, how do you get people to share beliefs? You know, in my opinion, the very first thing that I would do as a founder of a of a startup is I would look for a quadrant one, quadrant three fit. I would go out and evangelize. What is it? Why did I start this business? What's the problem I'm trying to solve? Well, before I start trying to build a product. Uh, it's a little bit like uh, I think Simon Sinek uh, said that start with why. He did. And uh, a lot of people have commented that about Quadrant 3, that they said to me, you know, I prefer to start in Quadrant 3. I want to face this question about why should my business exist? Because a belief, you can have a belief in your head, but does somebody else really share it? You know, do your staff share it? Do the shareholders share it? Do the customers share it? If they don't share the belief, you just appear to be this crazy person, you know, this guy that is always talking about this this belief that nobody else understands or cares about. Mm -hmm. uh, is it the place to reinvent your company also when you want to rebrand yourself, want to uh, change some of your products? Do you start essentially from Quadrant 3, who we are? Do you re-establish who you are? Yeah, so Quadrant 3 is on two levels. The first level is 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 like the corporate identity and quite often like if you're rebranding an organization because you've decided you want to move up from targeting say small business customers to enterprise customers you'll go to quadrant three and you will begin to augment and make your corporate identity a lot more um, should we say a lot more sophisticated because it has to do a lot more okay mm -hmm. Um, and you might want to change the, the tone of the way that you speak to customers as well. So that's the first part. But the second part is very important about the beliefs because here comes an interesting quadrant one, quadrant three fit. There is no point serving customers who do not share your beliefs because, Yanis, in the end, they will not stay with you because when you do have problems with the product, or they don't believe the, the direction of the product that you're going and they keep giving you the wrong information because they don't share the same belief as you, they become a real problem in your organization. Yeah, by, by also giving bad reviews and uh, not forgiving any of the mistakes you might make. Exactly, I understand. Right. That, yeah. So how did so, you apply Quadrant 3 to your business then? I spent a lot of time um, clarifying my be my beliefs about what I do and uh, really looking at quadrant one to whom whom do I serve and it uh, to tell you the truth I was uh, locked in a place that I couldn't find people that I didn't want to serve and quadrant three once I clarified my my beliefs and what are the shared beliefs I have with the people I serve then I realized that I, these people are uh, part of the people that I, I didn't want to serve in my company so I didn't finish quadrant one one, uh, until I finished Quadrant 3 and clarified exactly what are my beliefs and my uh, projects and uh, my uh, business beliefs are. So, Yanis, this comes back to why there's no such person as anybody who's going to buy this product. Because even if you take out of the equation for a moment Quadrant 2 and we just look at a Quadrant 1, Quadrant 3 fit, which is what you got, you've already discovered that there are a whole bunch of people who are not you, you cannot serve them because they don't they don't want to go on the journey with you to go the direction that you're going to take to see why is it that your consulting business is going to be different from another one exactly exactly and I realized why it bugged me so long that I tried to serve some people with you know all my heart and all my resources and everything like that and I didn't get the result I, I, I was expecting to. It, it, it was because I was talking to the wrong people. And what's very interesting about your business, right, is you have a, an additional level of exposure uh, which you do not have in a tech company because you see 
people who provide human services like consulting, right? Yeah. Um, they are the drivers of revenue in the business. So what happens is is that they are delivering the service directly to the other customer, right? And so when you hire them based on your beliefs and then you put them with a customer who doesn't share the belief, you it's end up gonna with work. staff. It's not going to work. Say, yeah. It's not going to work, right? And the staff saying, you know what? I didn't get paid to listen to this. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> And worst of all, he's gonna say, "What is he talking about? What 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 are yeah. all those things that he's talking about? It, it it doesn't affect me. It doesn't touch me. It doesn't it, you know? It, it doesn't resonate with me." Exactly. One so, of the data points that I go looking for myself in Quadrant One is I go looking for uh, decision makers who have had experience using frameworks. Because what I've found in my business is if you don't believe in, in frameworks, frameworks yeah. right? If you don't believe that frameworks are better than the uh, individual's ideas per se, right? Um, then I cannot help you in my business because it's like going to a developer and a developer says, oh, no, you don't need WordPress. You don't need a framework. I'll build you something from scratch. I'm better than WordPress. Do you share this belief? I don't know. Some people do. I, I don't. <laughs> exactly, exactly. I understand exactly what you say. And uh, I recently made the mistake of uh, contacting a company and started working with them before I had a conversation about the way that they would like to implement uh, the consulting I will give them to them. And once I realized that they, was, they weren't ready to implement the frameworks and the procedures that we had in place, and because just because they didn't believe in procedures and frameworks, I realized that okay, this is gonna go bad. <laughs> so it was exactly like like you said. If if someone doesn't share your beliefs, and uh, for me personally, it made me want to put some questions in the intelligence gathering procedure of my prospects to put some of my clients, of my the, the people I work with, to put some very clearly defined questions about, you know, finding out whether or not they have the same beliefs and we have shared beliefs so we can work together uh, to our benefit. Yeah, that's a great idea, Yanis. And if I may add, um, here's a very interesting experiment that our market researchers did. We found out that, so there's, when your sales team is trying to sell to a customer where you have not reached a quadrant one, quadrant three fit, you're talking to people who don't believe, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know that they only have a 5% chance of changing that person's belief? The, chance is, the chances of them changing that person's belief are almost zero and, and only the very, very, and guess what? Um, of the 5% who change, okay, it took us two weeks of talking to that customer and bashing them over their head and forcing them to change until finally they said, yes, we will see this, Your, I am changing my beliefs, and now I understand. So basically it's a huge waste of money, resources, and effort to advertise and to market to people that uh, they don't share your beliefs. Precisely, Yanis, you cannot change their minds. Not commercially. It's, it's too expensive. Mm, I understand. I understand. That's really great. That's really great information because uh, if you go to a company and they haven't defined who are the people that they want to talk to, basically you must say to them that uh, you, you, you see, uh, stop advertising now. You just, you know, uh, you have grabbed the gun and point and uh, shoot with, your, with a blindfold on. <laughs> <laughs> you might hit something sometime. <laughs> <laughs> you might. Exactly. You might get the donkey once. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. So let's talk about quadrant four, which I found really interesting. Yeah, this is my favorite quadrant. Um, when I build sales systems for companies, uh, one of the one of my tasks that I have to perform is I've got to design all the interactions, right, to create a customer, and that's what Quadrant Four is about. So Quadrant Four says, um, "What is the precise number of interactions required 
to create a customer. Now, in our research, we found that if you're targeting small business decision makers, you have to serve between 10 and 15 interactions. And if you're serving enterprise companies, Mm, you're supporting somewhere between 25 to 50 interactions. Now, this becomes quite important because when you're designing these interactions, see, Sorry, you start putting could, could a dollar value. Could you there. define interactions for us? What are, what are interactions? Yeah, sure. Customer interactions. So it's a touch point. It's the, it's the number of, uh, the precise number of touch points that you need to create a customer. So is that like... 10, it's, a, it's a call, it's, a, it's an email, it's a text message, it's a combination of all that. In fact, in one of your posts, you mentioned that how you personally have served customers who do not have a defined process or set of sequence of interactions to create a customer. And so what's happening is, is that when Sally contacts your organization and she speaks to Amber, she has a different experience. If she speaks to Jessica, she gets a different experience. But then she says, hmm, I like, I like Jessica's version. I only want to talk to Jessica. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And especially when uh, I really like the part in the book when you say when people, uh, it, it goes back to Quantro 2, but I, I, I want to point it out now that when you have different versions of the product, you fall, you fall into future selling of selling uh, something that the sales uh, the salesperson said it will be done and uh, that gets you in a lot of trouble yeah um, you know like one one way that that happens is because um, the marketing people write the fact sheets mm -hmm. and you know the problem with marketing people they're, they're lovely lovely people but they're very uh, imaginative and sometimes they hear things that the product people are saying and the product people are talking about something in the future, there is a bias where they hear it and they think, oh, it's right now, so I'll just put it down and start selling that. Mm -hmm. The salespeople are the same. They'll hear something, they don't realize, no, 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 it's in, it's in quarter four. It's not now. So what, one of the disciplines is I don't tell the salespeople and the marketing people the product roadmap because otherwise they will make this biased mistake where they start telling customers we have these things available and then the customer will say okay I bought the product you told me it has it it doesn't have it now go ahead and build it right now <laughs> exactly and then uh, all hell broke, uh, broke loose as we say <laughs> exactly so quadron 4 yeah. So quadrant four. I mean, of which, by the way, which was your favorite quadrant? I think it was quadrant four. Okay, it's my favorite as well. I think the reason why you enjoy it because it's it's like you can bring any experience you like, Yanis, that you've had, any buying experience that you had. For example, when you visited Tokyo Disneyland, or you did an unboxing of the new MacBook Pro, or um, you bought some beautiful software on the internet and you had a really good sign-up experience, right? You can take each of these unique experiences and you can bring it to a customer in an industry where these customers have never seen these experiences. And here's a funny thing, right? We've found that by just changing one or two experiences in Quadrant 4, customers think the product in Quadrant 2 changed. Ah, that's really interesting. Uh, why why, why right? did this happen? Because what they thought was is that because the whole experience of signing up or leading up to the to the purchase has changed, the product must have improved. No. I understand. Uh, it was the experience that uh, it in a, in essence the experience became part of the product. Exactly. And um, the experience, like when people talk about customer experience, they think that, well, it's just something that you worry about at the end. You know, we don't worry about the customer experience. But what we found was something very interesting. We discovered that there is a strong correlation between customer experience and sales. That means reduction of friction. You see, when you make 
and experience frictionless. In quadrant four, what happens is the customer feels, oh my goodness, this is so easy. I, it's like they just know what I want and it, they make it so simple. Uh, when you right? say that, it, 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 it comes to mind the, the one button uh, buy click in Amazon, which I use a lot when I buy <laughs> books like yours uh, in Kindle, which you know you can buy with literally one click. And uh, the thing that comes to mind when I first encountered that was, my God, exactly what you said, this is so easy. Why not buy a book if it is so easy? You see, we can create experiences in our industry that nobody else is doing and yet we can have the same product in Quadrant 2. We can have a different shared belief in Quadrant 3. We can wrap that uh, corporate identity with our new experiences in Quadrant 4 and we can get people thinking that we have a new product in Quadrant 2 when actually all we did was modify Quadrants 3 and 4. That's, and that's uh, essentially like reinventing the whole company. Yeah. And you know, the other thing that's interesting about Quadrant 4 for salespeople, right, is quite often salespeople, if they've got many, many products, you know, like some of these organizations we're working with, they've got hundreds of products, uh, like a bank, for example, right, and they don't know what to sell first. Well, one of the purposes of Quadrant 4 is to intelligently sell Quadrant 2. So what it does is, is that it helps the salespeople figure out what to sell next based on the, where the customer is in the journey. Yeah, I understand exactly what this you're saying. This is where you get a, yeah, please this is where you get a good Quadrant 2, Quadrant 4 fit. Yeah. So essentially Quadrant 2 and Quadrant 4 are interconnected in a way because uh, if you know what you serve and you are well uh, you know, you define well the touch points and uh, all the interaction with the client. Uh, you can have an amazing experience for the client, and so the, these two parts are really interconnected. Yeah, what you can see happening is uh, you can map quadrant four to quadrant one and two. So quadrant four can intelligently serve product, mm -hmm. and it also fits with quadrant one. So quadrant one, quadrant four is about how do I develop unique experiences in quadrant four for the various customer profiles that I serve in quadrant one. In fact, what's interesting is quadrant three permeates equally all of quadrants one, three, and four, but um, quadrants one, two, and four map against one another. Let me put the quadrants one, one time over here so we can... I'll repeat that for them. you. So quadrant three, right? is applies equally to quadrants one, two, and four. So even the product development is influenced by quadrant three. The, the interactions that you develop are wrapped with the words and pictures, right, that you develop from quadrant three. So quadrant three is, you, speaks unanimously to one, two, and four. However, one, two, and four map to each other according to the customers that you serve today, tomorrow, and never serve. And that's really that's really great because uh, as, uh, it, it all has to do in my in my mind as I work through the quadrants about clarifying everything in your business. And uh, once you clarify exactly quadrant one, quadrant, quadrant two, quadrant three, quadrant four, uh, it all it all comes in place. And for me, working on quadrant four was the most fun part because I already did the work before the rest quadrant, so it was. Exactly the part which I like to do, you know, build the procedures, uh, build the uh, words, build the pictures that we need. And uh, that was really amazing to experience in my own business. So I strongly recommend for people to take a look at the book and uh, come in touch with Anthony so he can help them redefine and uh, remove friction from their business. Thanks, Yanis. Awesome. Anthony, how, 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 how much time does it take for one uh, business, a small business, to implement the quadrants and uh, uh, have, uh, have to work through them and uh, have them have it, in, uh, it, it uh, in experience? Well, let's just say that you are a solopreneur, right? You're just a one-person business at the moment. 
Um, what's really useful about the four cues is that it, you can identify which quadrant you're working in day by day. So you could say, okay, today I want to work in quadrant two. I really need to drive down the friction in quadrant two. Or this week I'm going to work solely in quadrant four. I'm going to fix all these areas. So to, for, for you to roll it out to a one-person business only takes one hour because we can teach the four cues in an hour, right? And you can begin using yeah. the framework immediately. If you are, say, a 10-person business or a 100-person business, it takes about half a day to actually start using the vocabulary and the ideas where you gather line managers, right, from various parts of the business. You bring them into a virtual team and put them into different quadrants. So you assign the, the staff to be either a quadrant leader or a quadrant participant, so maybe like a support person in that quadrant. And this virtual team goes to work driving down friction every single week across the business. And I found that this is a great way to move a business forward because if a, if a team in each quadrant uh, has the responsibility of driving friction down, it, it will be done very quickly for the whole operation. And, uh, it will come down to uh, very specific procedures that uh, you know will remove friction as much as possible and have the customer experience and the customer journey through the business be done in much less time and in much uh, in, in, with a great with great experience the the four cues is a decision making framework its purpose is to help people make decisions rapidly and one of the feedback that i got from a, a user in the united kingdom he said to me Anthony, if, 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 it, if, it, if it only does one thing, the four cues creates this vocabulary that everybody in the business can understand so we know what decision is being made. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's really great. He put it in a really great way because most of the times the problems in businesses comes from bad communication in the department, isn't it? Yeah, just people not understanding the words that they use and words become a barrier. Uh, the four Q's, as you know, like the, it's who we serve, you know, what we serve, how we serve it, and who we are. We keep this thing really simple for people to understand. And there's no jargon in the book at all. We we wrote 21 iterations of the book, and we removed all of the jargon and all the words that confuse people to keep this really simple. Yes, it was something that. Uh, uh for me, not speaking the language, uh, not uh, not being in, in, fluent in English, it was really easy for me to understand it and read it. And uh, you know, it didn't have any jargon, as you said. And uh, that's exactly uh, the elegance of the system is it in in its simplicity. And uh, it's really hard to arrive to a point where you have a system and a framework that works, that does what it says, and it does it in a simply in a simple manner. Yeah, um, the I think the one uh, one chief operating officer said something to me very interesting. He said uh, he's from Singapore, and he said like Anthony, what 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 you're doing is is you're creating a virtual team, which gets people out of their silos, out of their functional teams, and gives them a way to communicate and talk, so that um, we don't have people thinking that friction is someone, some other department's problem. Now the whole organization can address friction and get serious about getting it out of the business. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And uh, if you want to uh, have more teamwork in your company, using a framework like that, using the four cues, I think it, uh, really, it, it's a really good uh, start to build you know, teamwork and have collaboration in the team because exactly as you said, it puts people in places, in uh, sectors, in uh, quadrants, in charge or participating and gives them the opportunity and uh, the tools to improve on that quadrant and remove friction. Yeah. So, I'm going to put the book back on here, Run Frictionless. You should find it on uh, the link down below if you're watching this video on YouTube or uh, later from the live. I'm going to put it down here for people to uh, go find it on uh, Amazon and download it. It's a really great book. I highly recommend it. Anthony, thank you very much for your explanation of the 4Q framework. 
uh, I, I gotta tell you it really helped me and uh, it will continue to help me as I reread and uh, you know uh, revisit it. Thank you Yanis for having me on the show and I really appreciate your review you posted on Amazon and all your feedback very positive and thank you sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much, thank you very much. Uh, and for you, for all of you out there, please like and su subscribe to our channel and we'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye. Have a nice day.